when it comes to ancient history, there are some names that'll never be forgotten. And Alexander the Great is without doubt a perfect example of this timeless phenomenon. But beyond his rather illustrious title, few people could tell you very much more about Alexander, except perhaps that he was rather partial to conquering, had an amazing horse and died very young. What's more, there's no debate about any of this. Alexander the Great can be traced with relative ease to a time and place where anything was possible for those who dared to try. Following in the footsteps of Alexander the Great doesn't require an encyclopedic knowledge of ancient Greece or a specialised classical education because he certainly left his mark wherever he travelled, keeping the trail alive to this very day. We're talking about a young man who discovered that he had the world at his feet and then, tragedy of tragedies, didn't know what to do with it. This truly is a remarkable story from the past that has a real resonance for the present and future and during the course of this programme, you'll hopefully get to know Alexander a great deal better. It took the wit and wisdom of another Alexander many centuries later to remark that a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. There shallow draughts intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. These words were penned by Alexander Pope, the 18th century poet who shared his great namesake's fascination with Homer's epic poems inspired by the Trojan War, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which Pope spent years translating into English. What he says is relevant to our programme about Alexander the Great because on the surface the young conqueror was a mighty hero to be revered and emulated, intoxicating all who encountered him with his not inconsiderable charms. However, when you delve deeper into the truth about Alexander the Great, the darker side of his nature is far from pleasant and the despotic flip side of his golden boy character is indeed sobering. To know a little of Alexander the Great may well excite feelings of national pride and patriotism but to know a lot will stand as a warning against the misuse of power by charismatic leaders who rise too high. As the 19th century Cambridge history professor Lord Acton so cleverly put it, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. In times of trouble, throughout history, it's simply been human nature to look for a leader, a hero if you like, to bravely make the world a better place. But for whom and at what price? Napoleon, Genghis Khan, Adolf Hitler, Attila the Hun, Rasputin the Mad Monk and Saddam Hussein. Indeed, the list could go on and on, all exploited popular acclaim in the first instance, whilst their megalomanic tendencies spiralled out of control. Whether or not Alexander the Great deserves to be put on the same list remains to be seen. And as his story unfolds, you'll be able to decide for yourself what manner of hero Alexander the Great really was. With our philosophical preamble complete, it's time to step back into the past when ancient Greece was literally the centre of the classical universe. 
to have a chance of gaining any insight whatsoever into the complex character of Alexander the Great, we do need to undergo a rapid immersion in Greek culture to set the whole story in context. Even armchair historians should be wary of judging events of the past by our modern day values, because the pictures that emerge as a result will inevitably prove to be somewhat distorted. It's hard to believe, looking at tranquil rural Greece today, that it was once such a hotbed of intellectual and political debate, with the likes of Plato, Socrates and Aristotle leading the way. The first inhabitants of this hot, dry, mountainous country, surrounded by Mediterranean islands, arrived about 40,000 years ago. During the Bronze Age, there were three Greek civilizations. The Cyclades, dating back to 2500 BC, were producing fine marble carvings. The Minoans, based on the island of Crete, began to flourish in 2000 BC, building fine ships and palaces. And last but not least, the Mycenaeans dominated Greece from 1600 until about 1200 BC. Although a very warlike people, the Mycenaeans were also highly skilled craftsmen and had developed their own form of writing and early Greek language. Excavations at Mycenae uncovered a sophisticated palace from the period, with ceremonial graves packed full of treasure. A beautiful golden death mask was thought to belong to the great Mycenaean king Agamemnon, first came to light in the 19th century. Sadly, for the archaeologist concerned, this romantic illusion was shattered, as the mask actually proved to be from an earlier time. Nevertheless, it must still have belonged to a very important Mycenaean royal, and is always referred to as the Mask of Agamemnon, even though it isn't. With the decline of the Mycenaean civilization, Greece fell into a dark age. War and famine plagued the land, the palaces were destroyed, the fine metalwork and pottery skills were lost, and the people forgot how to read and write. Consequently, there's little historical record of this period when the Greeks quite literally needed all their resources simply to survive. It took until about 800 BC for Greek culture to begin a resurgence known as the Archaic Period. This was the time of the independent city-states, each ruled by the most powerful man to rise to prominence in the district. The Greeks called these states polis, and this is the origin of our word politics. The leaders could often be tyrannical, as was the case in Athens in 612 BC, when Draco was appointed. He set up very severe laws, and even stealing food for a starving family was punishable by death. Again, the Greeks have contributed to the English language, as the word draconian has evolved to mean anything overly harsh. Some states were stronger than others. For example, the fearsome Spartans were a terrifying force to be reckoned with, and their entire culture revolved around military supremacy. But the Greeks didn't just clash with neighbouring city-states. The rising army in the region belonged to the Persians, who were empire-building throughout Asia Minor, better known to us as modern-day Turkey. One of the most famous battles in history took place at Marathon, just north of Athens, although it's not really remembered for the military action. It was 480 BC, and the Greeks were considerably outnumbered by the Persian army led by King Darius I, 
yet, thanks to an excellent strategy, the Greeks emerged victorious. A runner was sent the 25-mile distance to Athens to proclaim the good news. But unfortunately, the poor man dropped dead from exhaustion after fulfilling his duty. Although he did at least earn his place in the history books, because the marathon race that we know and love today was named in honour of this event. King Darius died shortly after this battle, but his son, Xerxes, wanted revenge. Crossing the Hellespont, the narrow stretch of water separating Europe and Asia that we know better as the Dardanelles, he advanced on Greece. The Spartan commander of the Greek army realised that there was no hope of resisting, so he sent his men into retreat to fight another day, while he held off the attack for as long as possible, sacrificing his own life for the greater good. Xerxes and his Persian army marched on Athens and set fire to the city, looting and despoiling whatever they could. It was an act that the Greeks could not forgive, and certainly never forget. Although this is a highly selective and extremely speedy race through Greek history, it does set the scene for what is to come particularly in terms of there being no love lost between the Greeks and the Persians. We have now entered what's termed as the Classical Period, the age of the great Greek philosophers, architects, sculptures, poets and artisans, and it's against this historical backdrop that Alexander the Great was to make his entry onto the world stage. To the north of Greece, the ancient kingdom of Macedonia couldn't exactly have boasted an enviable reputation during classical times. The people were thought to be little better than barbarians and positively backward when it came to politics. Instability, constant invasions and bloody civil war ravaged Macedonia. But when Philip II became king in 359 BC, matters improved dramatically. Once Philip had established control over his own kingdom, he turned his attention to the rest of Greece, and such was the threat that he posed, all the other states, including Athens and Thebes, joined together to form the Hellenic League against Macedonia. But it was the end of the independent city-states, and in 338 BC, Philip became the undisputed leader of all Greece after a decisive victory in battle. Evidently a wise politician as well as a military tactician, Philip united the Greeks with the promise of an expedition against the Persians to avenge the sack of Athens. However, when it came to women, Philip wasn't quite so shrewd. He fell in love with his beautiful queen, Olympias, when she was still in her early teens, but it proved to be a tempestuous relationship. Despite this, Alexander was born to them in 356 BC at the royal palace in ancient Pella, which is little more than a ruin today. From the moment of his birth, Alexander was indeed a great asset for Olympias, who as a Greek woman of the 4th century had no power or even status in her own right. With her son's birth, she had control of the heir to the Macedonian kingdom, and if the stories are no more than half true, Olympias was more than capable of turning the situation to her advantage. History has painted a very dark picture of Alexander the Great's mother. A Dionysus worshipping devotee of ecstasy and the pleasures of the flesh. 
Tales are told of Philip's disgust at discovering Olympia sharing her bed with the snake. And although she failed to convince her husband, she did a very effective job of persuading everyone else that the snake was in fact a god, the true and immortal father of her son Alexander. very religious with many gods who they worshipped. Unlike religion as we know it, each god had a specific role to play and people would pray to the ones most suited to their needs. Everywhere you travel throughout Greece you'll see temples in various states of repair dedicated to the great and the good. But if your crops weren't growing very well you didn't have to dash off and find a temple to Demeter, the goddess of the earth. Greek temples were not primarily for worship. They were created so that the gods and goddesses could stay in comfort when they visited Earth, something that they did according to Greek mythology on a fairly regular basis. Here's a very basic rundown of the story of the ancient Greek gods. In the beginning, there was nothing but emptiness, called chaos. And out of the darkness came Gaia, better known to one and all as Mother Earth. She gave birth to Uranus, the sky, and the two married with their resulting offspring being the Titans, who looked just like humans, but were of enormous size. These were the first gods and goddesses, and all was well until Uranus dispatched a number of them to the underworld, much to his wife's annoyance. With the help of their mother, the banished titans rebelled against Uranus, and led by Cronus, defeated and overthrew him. Now, as you've probably already guessed, in the world of the gods, Marrying your sister, brother, father, mother, son or daughter was pretty much the norm, and Cronus married his sister, Rhea. Paternally speaking, Cronus was a bit of a disaster area because he'd been warned that one of his own children would kill him. Consequently, when each baby was born, he swallowed it whole. But after losing five children in this manner, Rhea took evasive action when the sixth child, Zeus, was born. She wrapped a large stone in a shawl and gave that to Cronus to swallow and slipped Zeus away for safekeeping. Upon reaching manhood, Zeus returned in disguise and poured a magic potion into his father's drink, which made him spit out the five babies he'd swallowed. These brothers and sisters of Zeus, Poseidon, Pluto, Hera, Hestia and Demeter, joined with him to overthrow Cronus and take charge of the universe. The new Greek gods then lived on Mount Olympus. Zeus, as the god of the sky, became king over all. Hera married him and became queen. Poseidon took the oceans as king of the sea. Pluto ruled the underworld. Hestia became goddess of the hearth and home, leaving Demeter as the goddess of the earth. If you look at any map of Greece today, you'll find Mount Olympus marked just to the southwest of ancient Pella, where Alexander grew up, and it's a great favourite with walkers and climbers. In actual fact, 
The name refers to the whole mountain range, which is 12 miles across and nearly 10,000 feet at the highest point. But there's little danger of bumping into a thunderbolt wielding Zeus, as mortals were only very rarely admitted to the realms of the gods, and then strictly by invitation. When it came to gods visiting mortals, as we've already discovered, the traffic flowed far more freely. Zeus was notorious for ravishing mortal women in a whole variety of forms, including an eagle and a swan, much to his wife Hera's disgust. She seems to have spent a great deal of her time chasing around the earth, jealously punishing Zeus's women. So when you consider that for the majority of Greeks this was fact, not fiction, Alexander's mother's fabulous excuse about consorting with a snake god was perfectly feasible. Also, many of the great heroes of Greek mythology were born of these liaisons between gods and mortals. Hercules, Achilles, and the beautiful ship-launching Helen of Troy being prime examples. Therefore, bestowing heroic status on her baby son could only be a good thing for the Machiavellian Olympias. And from a very early age, Alexander would have truly believed that he was at the very least a hero, and more often than not, a genuine, bona fide god. In later years, he claimed to have been descended from Hercules on his father's side and Achilles on his mother's, which was quite some pedigree to live up to by any standards of genealogy. But King Philip would have none of it. The snakes were just too much to cope with, and he shunned Olympias in favour of a younger, less adventurous wife and queen. It was a dangerous move on Philip's part, because Olympias was not a woman it was safe to scorn, and all her attentions were turned to her son, making the bond between them obsessively unstable. For young Alexander, spoiled and doted upon, the fact that his father had a new wife and spare male heir would undoubtedly have displeased him. But Philip had a healthy respect for his firstborn son. The Lone Ranger had Silver, Roy Rogers Trigger, and Alexander the Great had Bucephalus, a magnificent horse that remained with him nearly all of his life, carrying the mighty conqueror into battle all across Europe and Asia. The story of how boy and horse first meet is an all-time favourite, inspiring countless equine enthusiasts throughout history. A fine young horse was brought to the court of Philip II, but nobody, not even the king, could ride him. Precocious in the extreme, young Alexander announced that he would tame the horse, which he proceeded to do by facing him into the sun so that Bucephalus would not be frightened by his own shadow. Then Alexander quietly talked to the animal evidently an early version of horse whispering, jumped upon his back and rode off at full speed to the utter amazement of all who witnessed it. King Philip jovially advised Alexander to get himself another kingdom, because Macedonia would definitely not be big enough to hold him, words that would prove to be profound indeed, and a warning if only Philip had realised the implications of what he'd said. As well as a natural intellect, 
Alexander received a phenomenal education at the hands of one of the greatest minds history has ever known. At about the age of 14, Alexander was sent to study with Aristotle, and the formative years spent with the great philosopher forged a mind as sharp as steel. The young man, who up until this point in his life had perhaps struggled to find a role model, looked up to Aristotle as a father figure. That Aristotle inspired Alexander is indisputable, and when he gave the boy a copy of Homer's Iliad, the story of the Trojan War, he changed the course of history. For the rest of his life, Alexander always carried the book with him, and if legend is to be believed, slept with it under his pillow wherever he travelled. It's interesting to note that despite Aristotle's satisfaction at Alexander's academic progress, the teacher actually feared what he'd created in his pupil. He was right to sense danger because of the many that would be slaughtered for daring to disagree with Alexander in the future. Aristotle's own beloved nephew, Callisthenes, numbered amongst them. years that Alexander was studying with Aristotle, Olympias may well have still been smouldering angrily away at her treatment by Philip, waiting for the day that Alexander would become king in his stead. Some believe that she speeded matters up a little, and if this is the truth, Alexander also has to be implicated in the following events. In June 336 BC, Philip was assassinated, and the 20-year-old Alexander succeeded him, making Olympias the most powerful woman in the kingdom. The fact that Alexander and Olympias immediately put Philip's second queen and child to death also suggests a ruthless conspiracy to further their own cause. A short distance from the remains of ancient Pella lies the village of Virginia, where in 1977 a remarkable archaeological find breathed new life into this tantalising tale. Hidden away inside a concealed tomb, 
A magnificent golden burial casket contained the bones of what must have been a very important Macedonian, interned with a fine array of weapons. The remains were of a middle-aged man who forensics showed had at some stage been wounded near his right eye. History tells us that Philip II lost his right eye in battle, almost certainly confirming that this discovery was the murdered king's final resting place. Also from the same period, a smaller chamber contained the body of a woman who was very probably the king's unfortunate second wife. The first few months of Alexander's reign were crucial. Philip had fiercely united a disparate land, but would Alexander be able to stamp his authority on the situation and take what he felt to be his birthright? The answer to this question came quickly and decisively. When the Balkans rebelled up in the north, he made a lightning strike up as far as the Danube to quash them. Thebes suffered an equally swift trouncing when they revolted against Macedonian rule, and Alexander efficiently eradicated the entire population by means of slaughter and enslavement. The powerful Athenians watched the fate of Thebes in horror and thought better of rebelling against Alexander, preferring to make peace rather than face genocide. Alexander might only have been 20 years old, but anybody who saw this as a weakness would never live to tell the tale. Even the scheming Olympias was curbed and had no choice but to obey Alexander's orders, as he thundered his way to lead all Greece unopposed by the time he reached his 21st birthday. Whenever a likeness of Alexander the Great is presented, he's a fine-looking young man, usually with fair or reddish-brown curling hair and the definitive regal bearing. However, the truth is, we really don't know for sure what he looked like. The portraits and sculptures that have survived down through the ages were most likely created for propaganda purposes, so he may not have been quite the handsome, prepossessing golden boy that history would have us all believe. There's a wonderful quaint old expression, handsome is as handsome does, which basically implies that the best-looking man in the entire world is worth nothing if he behaves badly, and Alexander was capable of behaving atrociously. Trying to assess what manner of man this young king was can actually prove much more difficult than finding a realistic likeness of him. Any psychologist with a penchant for case studies from the past would get enough material for an entire lifetime's work from the short but spectacular glory years of Alexander the Great. But before we tread any further in Alexander's footsteps, there are just a few points worth making to give a more accurate picture of what life was really like for a Macedonian king of the 4th century BC. That Alexander the Great was responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands is undisputed, as is the fact that at times he could be extremely cruel and sadistic, even with lifelong friends who just happened to get on the wrong side of his temper. To us, this condemns Alexander as a war criminal, but in his time this was how the greatness of a warrior king was measured. 
The more Alexander fought and conquered, the more he was revered, and the idea of war as a moral evil didn't actually become a matter of conscience until the early 19th century. In the same way, the subject of Alexander the Great's sexuality has to be treated with equal circumspection. In Alexander's day, people weren't categorised by their sexual preferences, homosexuality was not taboo, and bisexuality was commonplace within the culture. Neither was it just about sex. The male of the species spent most of his time in the company of other men, and the close friendships that developed were considered perfectly normal, respectable, and, above all else, honourable. An army could be away for years fighting to conquer new territories, so the close bonds that developed out of the camaraderie were invariably more meaningful than those with wives back home. In a well-to-do ancient Greek household, the men and women lived in separate sections of the house, marriage literally being for the procreation of children, and preferably of the male variety. It was certainly rare for a woman to emerge as Olympias, Alexander's mother had, so quite understandably, once she'd achieved power, she was reluctant to let it go. By the time that Alexander had conquered Greece, he'd already cast a covetous eye towards Persia, and he began preparations for a crusade. dynastic point of view, the young king would have come under considerable pressure to marry and produce an heir before leaving Greece, but this would definitely have not suited Olympias, at this point the most influential woman in Alexander's life. It's been suggested that she did everything in her power to prevent her son from marrying. If he succeeded in Persia, her jurisdiction was set to increase. But should the worst happen and Alexander die, her chances of staying at the top would be significantly improved without an heir apparent to get in the way. The fact that Olympias may have been pathologically jealous of any female Alexander formed a relationship with also can't be ruled out. This may not have been all one-sided either, as history shows that Alexander didn't find relationships with women easy. Some accounts record that he was at least 23 before he had sex with a woman, and any that he did become involved with tended to be of more mature years and distinctly motherly in outlook. Our psychologist friends would instantly spot an Oedipus complex. Classic son in love with his mother, wanting to kill his father sort of stuff. Not to mention ids, egos and superegos all out of balance. And although such terms perhaps mean little to us lesser mortals, it's rather evident that even at the outset the great all-conquering hero Alexander was a troubled soul. They do say that there's a very fine line between genius and madness, and as you're about to discover in Alexander's case, deciding between the two will be a very tough call.
the last farewell between mother and son took place in spring 334 BC, as Alexander, commander-in-chief of the combined Greek armies, set sail for Persia across the Dardanelles. When it came to important decisions, the ancient Greeks were very keen on consulting the oracles, where a priestess would answer for the gods in a holy place. The most famous oracle in Alexander's day was at Delphi in the temple of Apollo. Mythology records that Zeus, the king of the gods, released two eagles from opposite ends of the world, and where their paths crossed was deemed to be the centre of the earth, and Delphi was the point at which they met. For centuries, people from all over the ancient world consulted the oracle at Delphi about their destinies, and Alexander was no exception. However, the manner of his visit tells us a great deal about a young man in a tremendous hurry to make his mark on the world. When Alexander arrived at Delphi to ask about his proposed foray into Persia, it was a bad day for the oracle and she wasn't giving any answers. This wasn't just a whim on the part of the priestess. Some days were considered more auspicious than others, and most people would patiently wait for the wise woman to return to the shrine for a spot of prophesying when the fates were of a kindlier disposition. But Alexander was not a patient man so he sought out the oracle and attempted to drag her to the temple. When en route, she cried out that he was invincible, possibly more out of annoyance than anything clairvoyant, it was all he needed to hear. The boy, who'd grown up believing himself to be a god amongst mortals, was ready to embark on his journey into Persia and manhood, safe in the knowledge that the greatest oracle of them all had spoken in his favour. As Alexander set foot on Persian soil, he had a personal pilgrimage to make before instigating any sort of military campaign. This was the Trojan Plain, a land resonant with the bloody cries of Alexander's ancestors, where modern-day travellers will find themselves in Turkey. Here, Achilles fought and died for Greek honour in the great Trojan War of Homer's Iliad, when the beautiful Helen was the valued prize that eventually only a wooden horse could secure. Overlooking the rippling waters of the Hellespont, the ancient name for the Dardanelles, where Lord Byron, the infamous poet, once swam the three miles separating Europe and Asia, Alexander first came upon the tomb of Achilles. Now Alexander was not alone because his great friend from childhood, Hephaestion, was with him as he would be throughout all the battles ahead. With ritualistic glee, the pair ran naked around the sacred tomb before making their way up to what was left of the magnificent city of Troy. For today's visitors, the sight of Troy can come as something of an anti-climax. We all imagine spectacular ruins, when in fact, what you'll actually find is an ongoing archaeological excavation. What's more, you'd be in good company feeling somewhat disappointed, because Alexander was horrified to find very little of the city's former glory, with Troy already in ruins back in 334 BC.
In a small windswept temple to the goddess Athena, Alexander was told that the shield that hung on the wall had belonged to Achilles. Replacing it with his own, Alexander proudly took the shield of Achilles, which was to remain with him for the rest of his life. Alexander also made a promise to return to restore Troy and build the biggest temple in the world to Athena in honour of his illustrious ancestors when his conquering ambitions had been realised. But as you can see, not everything that Alexander planned came to fruition, no matter how great he was to become. The first major battle of the campaign was fought just outside Troy at a place called Granicus, where the Persian army was swelled in numbers by Greek mercenaries who'd refused to be governed by a mad boy from Macedonia. But against all the odds, Alexander triumphed, refusing to listen to his own advisers, forcing through his own strategy against the enemy. Alexander's planned route was now wide open, and he marched on Sardis, where the city surrendered without a fight. Today, if you travel to Bergama, between the battle site of Granicus and Sardis, you'll find the impressive Acropolis of Pergamum overlooking the modern town. Alexander had a vision of this as a perfect Greek city, and there is most definitely a Grecian feel to the elegant ruins, which once boasted a magnificent palace, temple, theatre and library. In later years, the Romans made Pergamum the capital for their occupation of Asia, but fortunately those who pass this way today, many actually on the trail of Alexander the Great, tend not to be of a despotic disposition, and this once influential city is now a peaceful haven of cultural tranquility. Pushing ever onwards, Alexander passed through Ephesus where he promised to rebuild the great temple to Artemis. But if you come here today, it's the architectural handiwork of the Romans that's most in evidence. The beautiful ruins of the Library of Celsus are famous the whole world over, and the statues in the niches are to Roman gods rather than Greek deities. The Goths had a valiant attempt at destroying the place, and a later earthquake also took its toll, but this is undeniably one of the loveliest ruined cities to be found anywhere. However, if Ephesus sounds familiar, it's more likely to be because of its religious significance for Christians. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is said to have been brought here by St John the Evangelist in AD 37 to peacefully live out her days. Also St Paul, although a visitor in person to Ephesus, is best known for his letters to the early Christians here, recorded as the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. Not all of the Persian cities gave way to Alexander quite so compliantly, and he did meet resistance at Miletus, although it was short-lived. Forging the campaign further, Alexander found himself in the vicinity of Didyma, where a once famous oracle had fallen silent and the sacred spring had dried up. Ever watchful of his own propaganda, Alexander instigated a magnificent PR coup and whether fact or complete fiction, it certainly enhanced his godlike reputation. It was a miracle. As Alexander and his army approached Didyma, the spring burst back into life. Seeing it as a good omen, the oracle was restored and a priestess appointed, and wonder of wonders, when she foretold Alexander's fortunes, all the news was incredibly good. 
Not only was he assured victory and the death of his rival, King Darius III, Alexander was also promised that he would be leader of all Asia. This couldn't have come at a better time, just as Alexander had probably engineered, because the next city on his hit list required a much greater application of strategy and skill. This is Bodrum in Turkey, today a popular tourist destination. But when Alexander arrived here in the 4th century BC, it was known by its ancient name, Halicarnassus. If this is familiar from somewhere in the dark recesses of your memory, it's because it was the site of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. King Morsalus built a huge tomb, which is where the word mausoleum comes from. This stood as an architectural wonder until the late 15th century. Already fallen into disrepair, the stones were recycled to build the Crusader Castle of St. Peter that stands in the harbour to this day. At the earlier Battle of Granicus, a Greek mercenary, Memnon of Rhodes, who knew Alexander of old, had advised against fighting a pitch battle. He was sure that frustrating the hot-blooded Macedonian would bring better results. Fortunately for Alexander, the Persians chose to ignore the advice, which cost them dear, but Memnon was prepared to wait and fight another day. Promoted to Persian commander-in-chief of the western operations of King Darius III, Memnon and his men had concentrated their forces at Halicarnassus, ready to give Alexander a nasty surprise. Memnon forced a siege, which really challenged the young king, and at one point it looked as if he would send Alexander packing. If it hadn't been for the steadying influence of his late father, King Philip's generals, the outcome might well have gone Memnon's way. As it was, Memnon judged the perfect moment to evacuate when the battle was obviously lost, and withdrew his army under the cover of darkness for the island of Kos. It might have been a victory for Alexander, but he'd suffered heavy losses, and he let a potential nemesis in the form of Memnon slip through his fingers, ready to pounce again at a future date. Through the winter months, Alexander steadily made his way along the southwest coast, before heading up over mountainous terrain towards the interior of Asia Minor. His destination was admittedly strategic. The city of Gordian was a key acquisition for any would-be conqueror heading eastwards. But Alexander, with his developing genius for PR, had another scheme afoot. Stepping back into the realms of mythology, Gordian had been the seat of the legendary King Midas, who wished, greedily and foolishly, to have everything he touched turn to gold, with disastrous consequences. But Midas was from humble origins. His father, Gordius, was a migrant peasant who arrived in the district in a wooden cart. Unbeknown to Gordius, Zeus, the king of the gods, had decreed that the next man to ride a wagon to his temple should rule the people of Phrygia, this ancient kingdom. Gordius fitted the bill perfectly, and the penniless peasant was so delighted at becoming a king so unexpectedly, he tethered his wagon to a pillar in the temple of Zeus as an offering of thanks. The knot he used was so intricate, people believed it impossible to untie, 
and another of those all-seeing oracles prophesied that whoever managed to undo it would become the ruler of all Asia. For the publicity-seeking Alexander, this legend was an absolute gift, despite the misgivings of his advisers who couldn't help wondering what would happen if he failed to undo the knot. They needn't have worried. By this stage, Alexander was writing his own rule book, and after he'd considered the knot for a few moments, the complexities proving beyond him, he had one of those eureka moments raised his sword and, in a flash, hacked the knot in two. The fact that nobody else had seen this as an option spoke volumes for Alexander's audacity, and yet another oracle was backing the daring, winning Greek. If there were sceptics, who believed that Zeus might take offence at the young upstart's cavalier attitude, Alexander managed to convince them that an almighty thunderstorm that same night was proof of the omnipresent Zeus's approval. Alexander, the impatient wannabe king of the world, was once again on his way. Then, all of Alexander's consultations with the oracles and deep belief in the gods and fates were rewarded. As he marched towards Ankara, Alexander was blessed with an extraordinary piece of luck. Memnon had regrouped after the siege of Halicarnassus, strategically placing his men into a position of strength. It had become Memnon's mission to dispose of Alexander and, by this stage, it was definitely personal. But Memnon suddenly fell ill and died, leaving King Darius with the problem of Alexander. Searching for a new commander-in-chief proved problematic, particularly as the best candidate for the job was another Greek mercenary, a disenchanted Athenian. Darius was told, in no uncertain terms, that the Persian army was simply not up to the job and thousands of Greek mercenaries would be needed to be drafted in to stand any chance of halting Alexander's progress. True as the statement might have been, it was evidently somewhat lacking in tact and diplomacy. Darius took great offence and promptly had the straight-talking Athenian executed. Consequently, Darius, having no one else to turn to, had no choice but to take charge of the situation himself and lead his own army against Alexander. Alexander's troops marched on relentlessly, down through the Cilician gates, a deep narrow gorge and on to Tarsus. It sounds incredibly romantic, but all that's left of this historic landmark today has been concreted over with a vast high-speed motorway. Alexander's run of great good fortune came to a rather abrupt halt at Tarsus, where he fell gravely ill. With the benefit of modern medical insight, we can make an educated guess that his problem was malaria. For his doctors way back in the 4th century BC, Alexander seemed to be near to death. Rumours flew around the Greek and Persian camps that Darius had hatched a plot to poison his rival, but Alexander made a full recovery and a new set of battle lines were drawn. Time now for just a brief look at the region Alexander was passing into, which has become of such a great strategic significance in the 21st century. When news programmes describe Turkey as a bridge between Europe and the Middle East, they are talking geographically, socially and politically, and the same was true in Alexander's day. For modern tourists, although Turkey is predominantly a Muslim country, religion is less of an issue than it tends to be the further east you travel.
visitors who have never experienced a Muslim country before will feel perfectly comfortable, and so long as they respect the local customs, particularly in terms of dress code and alcohol consumption, they can enjoy a wonderful holiday without too many constraints. But as Alexander made his way through Turkey towards Syria, the Lebanon, Israel and Egypt, any sense of a vacation was well and truly over, as King Darius was ready and waiting to take on the young upstart Greek at the Battle of Isis. Darius was undoubtedly a much older and wiser king than Alexander, despite the bad press that history has often tended to give him, and he played a very strategic hand when he encircled Alexander's army. The Persians also outnumbered the Greeks considerably being on home territory, and they devised a plan that would take out the Greeks' best fighting tactic, the Macedonian phalanx. This was a disciplined formation of foot soldiers with shields and spears, but to counter this, Darius had brought in significant numbers of Greek mercenaries who knew the fighting tactics, strengths and, more importantly, weaknesses very well. The Battle of Isis took place in November 333 BC, and Darius's plan would ironically have worked had the rest of his army been up to scratch. Alexander led his attack in person, easily breaking through enemy lines. His much-feared Macedonian phalanx was being held back very effectively by Darius's mercenaries, but they were well aware that the rest of the Persian army was losing control and soon chose to retreat rather than perish. Alexander then focused his attack on Darius, but the Persian king had fled the scene. The most fearsome image we have of Alexander is in a mosaic of the Battle of Isis that was discovered in Pompeii in 1831. It's actually a Roman interpretation of a painting done some time after the battle, depicting Alexander and Darius in full flight. It's clear that Alexander, just as the oracle at Delphi had been forced to predict, was invincible. Who can say how far Alexander intended to go when he set sail across the Dardanelles? With two major battles now behind him and the Persian army all but crushed, his self-belief was growing daily. Alexander stormed through Syria and Lebanon, wherever he met resistance, emphatically crushing it with escalating ruthlessness. The siege of Tyre ended with a brutal sack of the city, with thousands slaughtered or taken prisoner. With news travelling as fast as Alexander, it's astonishing that anyone was prepared to stand against him, but when he reached Gaza, still a bloody battleground to this very day, the governor of the city refused to surrender. Alexander resorted once again to siege mentality, but he didn't have it all his own way. In the early stages, Alexander was badly wounded, and it took three months for the city to fall. It ended with ferocious hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the streets, where Alexander was again wounded, but the victory was his. Revenge followed swiftly and savagely. 10,000 were killed, and the badly wounded governor was brought before Alexander. Still refusing to bow to the conquering hero, the governor suffered a brutally sadistic fate contrived by Alexander. As we already know, Alexander was obsessed with the stories of his ancestor Achilles in the Trojan War. When his adversary Hector had killed Achilles' closest friend Patroclus, a bitter personal fight took place between the two heroes. 
Eventually, Achilles proved victorious, but cruelly tied Hector to his chariot by the ankles and dragged him around the city walls for days on end. Alexander, inspired by the legend, had the defiant governor of Gaza's ankles pierced and ropes threaded through so that he could be tethered to the chariot and dragged around the walls of Gaza until dead. At least poor old Hector was already deceased by the time he got dragged about Troy. Alexander was already showing a brutally cruel streak and a serious disregard for human life beyond what was expected of an ancient conqueror, even at this early stage in his campaign. There was little or no resistance as Alexander marched his army into Egypt, but historians find themselves questioning exactly what was going on in Alexander's head at this point in the proceedings. He was determined to visit the famous oracle at Siwa, taking a month out from his campaign schedule to make the journey into the desert to consult the gods. For Alexander, the reward was all he could have wished for when he was proclaimed the son of Zeus, making him a god in his own right. When he asked whether he would rule the world, the answer was a resounding yes. What more did Alexander need? This one visit sealed the tragic fates of thousands of innocent people who would be sacrificed because Alexander believed that he could do no wrong, tipping the balance of an already disturbed mind beyond reason. Elated by his new godlike status, Alexander laid the foundations for a great city on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt to be named Alexandria, the first of more than 30 cities that would bear his name. The city of Alexandria is perhaps better known today, however, because of the building of a magnificent marble lighthouse here in 280 BC, which stood until the 1300s, when it was destroyed by an earthquake. Another of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the lighthouse at Alexandria was a welcome beacon for ships sailing into this busy port, long after Alexander had claimed Egypt for his ever-expanding empire. While Alexander had been busy in Egypt, Darius had taken the opportunity to rebuild his army, ready to meet the Greeks once more as Alexander turned northwards, back through Syria and Iraq, heading for Darius's stronghold at Babylon. But quite inexplicably, instead of waiting for Alexander to come to him, he marched his troops north to the small town of Guagamela, where the two armies fought in a mist of billowing dust. Amongst the confusion, it was soon obvious that the Greeks still reigned supreme and Darius was forced to flee the battlefield. Now Babylon, Mesopotamia and Susa lay at Alexander's feet. The conqueror was in the heart of modern-day Iraq, with the ancient city of Babylon lying just to the south of Baghdad. There was little resistance to Alexander's advances, and the prophecies of his becoming lord of all Asia had been fulfilled. However, things were about to get a whole lot tougher as he moved into the barren, mountainous heartland of Darius's empire. If Alexander's motivation had been to remove any threat from the Persians, he'd succeeded, but having come this far, his appetite for conquering was definitely growing. The journey ahead now led to the Persian gates and ultimately the city of Persepolis, where the great and good of the Persian royal dynasties were buried in magnificent tombs. The race was on, 
because Alexander knew that the treasury at Persepolis was full to overflowing. But if Darius's men got there first, it would be emptied. Yet again, Alexander was invincible, finding riches beyond measure, which he could use to fund as many military advances as took his fancy. All along, he had G'd up his men with tales of Persepolis as the most hated place on earth, the sacred citadel of their enemy, and to reward the army, he allowed looting on a horrific scale. The sack of Persepolis was barbaric, but worse was to come. Heavy drinking was part of the Macedonian culture, where a battle was always followed by the ritual consumption of vast quantities of wine to drunken excess. Most people will be able to tell you that Alexander the Great had a reputation for being an alcoholic, but just like the issue of his homosexuality, you must consider his legendary drinking binges in context. Yes, Alexander could drink his men under the table, but he had to. He was their leader in every respect, and it was quite simply what was expected of him. However, it was fast becoming evident that heavy drinking and a growing tendency towards megalomania, not to mention the erratic mood swings of a manic depressive, were transforming Alexander from the golden boy of ancient Greece into a dangerous loose cannon with sufficient power to do a great deal of damage. And this is precisely what happened at Persepolis. One evening, after a frenzy of feasting and drinking, Alexander was in the company of Thais, an Athenian prostitute. She whispered to Alexander that the complete destruction of Persepolis would be the crowning glory of his campaign. In the heady, drunken atmosphere of the night, the whole company leapt up, grabbed flaming torches and followed Alexander and Thais, marching out into the classically beautiful city, wreaking utter destruction. This would not be the last of Alexander's drunken rampages, and as far as his sanity was concerned, the writing was on the wall. Getting rid of Darius once and for all was, needless to say, a high priority on Alexander's to-do list, and the wanted man's whereabouts reached Greek ears. On the road towards Tehran, Darius's generals were ordering him to escape with them, but Darius refused. Alexander's brutality towards captured enemy commanders might well have been exaggerated, but the Persians were not hanging around to find out. For them to survive, Darius had to go with them or die. So finally, the defeated Persian king was actually stabbed by his own men and left to perish. When a Greek soldier discovered him, Alexander was called, and Darius bequeathed his empire to the victorious young king of the world with his dying breath. Now this is the Greek version of history, and precisely the press release that we would expect from Alexander's PR machine. Greek army were jubilant at the news. It was three years since the men had first set foot on Trojan soil, and they were ready to go home. But Alexander must have been pretty persuasive, because somehow he got his army to follow him ever eastwards into more hostile territory. In search of what? Nobody knew. 
If you follow the next leg of Alexander's journey, you'll find yourself in Afghanistan, where in the inhospitable mountains, the conditions and the bandits are equally as dangerous as they would have been for the Greeks all those years ago. The Kawak Pass over the Hindukush Mountains range was just one of the obstacles they faced, but Alexander marched on relentlessly. His physical strength was immense, but what about the state of his mind? Were matters improving or getting even worse? The answer was definitely in the negative, as proven when he turned on one of his own faithful generals. Black Clytus had served under King Philip, Alexander's father, and was one of the old guard who'd so bravely saved the day back at the Battle of Granicus. There was a huge party after various skirmishes, and all present were extremely drunk. Alexander was in a belligerent mood, proclaiming his own greatness and berating his father for bearing him ill will and being jealous of his success. The psychologists would certainly read all manner of significance into this, but Clytus was appalled and told Alexander that all his glory was due to his father. This was not the thing to say to somebody exhibiting all the symptoms of an extreme Oedipus complex, who very probably had already murdered his father. Accounts of what happened next vary, but most concur that in a frenzied rage, Alexander grabbed a javelin and slaughtered Clytus where he stood. It was a telling moment, and with the resulting terror around his court, nobody was going to ever disagree with Alexander again. The tyrant in him was nurtured from that time onwards by his inner circle, and the deterioration in his sanity progressed unchecked. Alexander's next move was completely out of character. He fell in love with a young Afghan slave girl, Roxanne, who'd been taken captive along the way. The fact that he then married her has been the subject of much speculation, and the stuff of Alexander legends from medieval romances through to Afghan folklore. Life was becoming even harder for the people close to Alexander, as he marched continually eastwards, as escalating numbers of plots were hatched to assassinate him. Although never proved to be implicated in such a death threat, Alexander's historian, Callisthenes, spoke out against his despotic behaviour. Despite being the nephew of Aristotle, Callisthenes paid for his integrity with his life. Alexander had him tortured and then crucified as a warning to others to keep in line. And still the relentless conqueror forged on, with his sights set on India, fighting endless battles along the way. The strain on his great warhorse, most faithful friend and ally, was finally beginning to tell, and at the grand old age of 20, Bucephalus died after a particularly bloody battle from all his wounds. casualties were rising, and the Greeks, so long and so far away from home, began to feel that the fates were now turning against them. It took immense courage, given Alexander's brutal treatment of dissenters, but eventually his senior officers stood up to him and refused to go any further. Alexander threw a major tantrum, sulking in his tent for days, when none of his old tricks to spur the men on worked. There were too many against him, 
and democracy at last clipped the conqueror's wings. The journey back was going to be long and arduous, and that was without taking Alexander's erratic behaviour into consideration. When they returned to Susa, he forced a hundred of his officers to marry Persian brides. Alexander could, of course, have as many wives as he wanted, and along with Hephaestion, married the captured daughters of King Darius. In a huge wedding ceremony, as many as 10,000 rank-and-file Greek soldiers were also forced to marry captured Persian women as Alexander sought racial supremacy in the land he'd captured. This was a really bad move, with Alexander and Hephaestion both now in the habit of playing God, becoming increasingly hated. Epic drinking binges continued, but after one such bout, Hephaestion fell ill and died. The poor doctor called in could do nothing, but Alexander flew into a maniacal rage and had the unfortunate medic crucified. When Alexander himself fell ill after reaching Babylon, the doctors must have felt very intimidated. He was feverish and deteriorated rapidly with no obvious explanation, except many were wondering if a poisoner was at large, particularly in the light of Hephaestion's recent suspicious demise. Before reaching the age of 33, Alexander was great no longer, drawing his last breath in 323 BC, far from his Macedonian homeland, never to see his mother Olympias again or receive a conquering hero's welcome. It was the end of an era. Those close to Alexander battled for control of his empire, but the casualties soared. Roxanne and the heir she produced for Alexander were murdered, just as she had disposed of Alexander's second wife from the mass ceremony at Susa. Olympias was killed in a civil war that erupted in Macedonia after news of Alexander's death reached Greece. Eventually, the empire was split between Alexander's generals. The most famous, Ptolemy, took Egypt and set off with Alexander's embalmed body. Plans were set in motion to transport Alexander back to Macedonia, but Ptolemy liberated him for Egypt, choosing to lay the troubled soul to rest very appropriately at the heart of Alexandria. Antigonus ruled the homeland of Greece, including Macedonia, Seleucus Asia, and Asia Minor, our present-day Turkey, became an independent state. Alexander's time on the ancient earth was very brief, but his incredible journey over ten years, travelling as far in distance as circumnavigating the globe, has gone down in history as one of the truly great adventures. It's a story of war, bravery and cruelty, immense courage and chronic insanity. Perhaps it does take a mixture of genius and madness to lead your fellow men to the ends of the earth, for that is precisely where Alexander intended to go, had the fates allowed. 
An interesting find after Alexander's death were the plans he'd made to conquer the world, which no doubt our modern-day psychologists would find very enlightening indeed. Firstly, he wanted to progress as far west as he had east, taking Carthage on the North African coast before storming across to Gibraltar and onwards through Europe, building an empire stretching as far as Britain and even beyond. He was planning a Greek world state, with blueprints for rebuilding Troy and a whole host of temples, but one monument in particular comes as something of a surprise. Many of Alexander's troubles stemmed from his turbulent relationship with his father, who he gave every impression of hating with a fanatical passion. Yet he'd intended to build a magnificent pyramid tomb, bigger and better than the Great Pyramid at Giza, in honour of King Philip. Evidently, there was a contradiction of emotions at play here, and if Alexander was hoping to appease a guilty conscience, he left it too late. There are so many unanswered questions concerning Alexander the Great, and he was, is, and forever will be a tantalising enigma, as brilliant madmen often are. William Shakespeare, the world-famous dramatist, wrote, Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. But trying to work out which category Alexander belonged to will get you nowhere. He made the title Great his own, because he could quite literally tick every box. Alexander was born great. His mother Olympia certainly saw to that, and with plenty of natural attributes, he had a major head start in life. It could also be said that he had greatness thrust upon him, because the magnitude of his father, King Philip's greatness, constantly overshadowed Alexander as he battled to find his own identity. Nevertheless, it's Alexander's own achievements that catapulted him from history into legend. Forever a sparkling example of where courage and determination can take you, but a poignant warning against the cruel excesses of war. A lesson that the world, more than 2,000 years on, has still to learn.